A warm welcome to this panel at the World Health Summit 2021 here at the Cosmos in Berlin. Epidemic preparedness beyond COVID-19. What can be learned from low resource settings? I think we've heard quite a bit about epidemic and pandemic preparedness uh, these last two days, but I can assure you that there are still a lot of new perspectives on this topic. On this panel, we will deal with epidemics that did not get much public attention in Europe, in Germany, before and during the COVID-19 outbreak. The working thesis for our panel is, what a pity we could have known even more about epidemic management here in Germany if we had paid better attention to the expertise of our partners in Africa. My name is Judith von Heusinger. It's my pleasure to be chairing this event. I work for the Else Gruner Fresenius Foundation, who is the host of this event. The central theme of this year's World Health Summit is pandemic preparedness. The Else Gruner Fresenius Foundation offers an annual award that is worth 100,000 euros. This year, the award was advertised on the topic of epidemic preparedness and response. Wow, what a coincidence. Now, given the current global health challenges, it's perhaps not all that surprising. But this is the reason why the foundation is hosting an event uh, during this World Health Summit conference. I am delighted that three award applicants that the selection committee of the foundation found especially convincing and especially uh, promising have joined us today here on this panel, including a representative of the award-winning project. And this distinguished group of people is completed by two additional experts. And you will see that this is really a practitioner's panel with people working on the ground who have lots of expertise with implementing projects in the field. I would first of all like to introduce uh, Dr. Joost Buttenop. He has over 20 years of experience in international humanitarian assistance and development cooperation. Currently, he works for the regional government Lower Franconia in Germany. And his role today is to discuss which aspects of epidemic preparedness and response that will be presented by the other panelists with a focus on different African settings could well be included into German policies and programs and the European context. But before we delve deep into our main guiding question, Joost, the first question goes to you. In what respect was Germany maybe not so well prepared for the COVID-19 outbreak that hit the country at the beginning of last year? Let's hear your perspective. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you for the introduction uh, and the kind words and welcome uh, to all of you in, uh, in this small panel. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not sure this can be run, possibly. Here we go. Okay. I give you some signal that uh, when the next slide is due, or how do we do it? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is the basically the the the, the headline of this uh, of, of of today's uh, workshop. Uh, next, please. Um, the next, please. What do I say? Say a next, or what do I say? Oh, thank you. I've got something here. That's good. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Looking in the in the um, post-COVID times, uh, um, epidemiologists uh, and field people look at the next one. So after the first uh, or the, the, the last big pandemic is the question, is this before the next? And if we look at a time uh, scale uh, of the last 2000 years, we can see that in the, well, you know, last 50 years, we saw quite a few of those which also have been labeled um, a public health, oh, sorry, that was too quick, public health emergencies um, uh, of international concern. Um, some say it has been used inflammatory or inflationary, but at the same time, uh, we do see larger outbreaks uh, in recent years. And uh, so it is likely that this is going to happen again. We're not going to wait another 100 years or 50 years before the next one comes. Uh, so in this respect, we need to be uh, looking uh, uh, clearly ahead into the future and uh, learn from what, what can be learned. Um, 
One component I would like to introduce that we know from the, from the area of um, uh, disaster medicine um, is what we call the VUCA events. Uh, so the pandemic was exactly this. It was a volatile uh, event. It was uncertain. It was complex um, because also it was a worldwide pandemic uh, and it was ambiguous. And all those four components make it very difficult to, to, uh, to deal with, especially if the response is actually coming largely from a government side, which is the, which is the job of the government side. Um, and I would like to uh, go back to Max Weber, who is a German sociologist who uh, thought a lot about um, bureaucratic systems and bureaucratic organizations 100 years ago. Incidentally, he died of the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Um, uh, but before he died, he, he also made uh, very interesting observations, which I would like to share with you because the question is where do we stand 100 years on from that one. He states that bureaucratic organization, which is the government and also the government response is technically the most efficient form of organization possible. Uh, with all that you can read their precision, unambiguity, um, knowledge of files, continuity, um, subordination and so on. Uh, but there's also of course some challenges coming with it. And uh, one of the challenges is that uh, government systems may not well cope with uncertainty and complexity. This is something we have seen virtually in, in all governments around the world with uh, dealing with a pandemic, uh, which is a VUCA event. Um, also, um, government systems do not give easily rise to innovation, which is something that might be useful in a, in a situation of, a, of a, a VUCA events. And it's hard also to share authority and to deal with other agencies um, uh, to link in, in, in partnership with uh, non-governmental organizations, for example. And uh, um, uh, so this I want to set as, as a frame uh, um, where we basically stand because uh, government systems are basically not able to deal with VUCA events. And that's something that, uh, uh, that we need to work on. Max Weber has gone much further in this, uh, but I want to cut it short here and, and look into the preparedness, maybe all over Europe, but especially also in Germany. Uh, if we look at the insurance companies, um, they make a risk rating and they look at issues uh, like economic structure, um, we could say tick, labor market tick. So most of the points that they've been looking at, also the healthcare system, has been able to manage and to deal with the with the outbreak um, to a certain extent. Um, population was, of course, an issue, but if you look at the map, Germany is is, is wide, so has clearly the least uh, of all risk factors uh, from the from the insurance company side. Um, but at the same time, um, our health system, which is normally based on three pillars. Where's the third pillar? It's gone, it's coming, okay. Uh, which is um, uh, basically public health on the one side, but also um, the, the clinical care, which is outpatient care and inpatient care. These are the three big columns of which the German health system is relying. And uh, the one on the left-hand side, the public health side um, has, um, well, we could say suffered over the last 40 years of, uh, um, of, of, of various shortages. Um, uh, and in times of a pandemic, you need a public health service to, uh, to um, basically run um, pandemic uh, operations. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't want to go through all the details because it will, it will uh, take too much time, but uh, um, some people have argued that over time has the, uh, you know, has the system uh, fallen apart, uh, which I don't think has really been the case, but uh, it has been, let's say, shaken in its foundations. And uh, it needs clearly some uh, some refurbishment, um, uh, which could be, you know, challenges in central coordination, um, intersectoral committees. Uh, the question is, who has been advising whom uh, in this whole pandemic? Um, what was the constitution or, or the, the um, people who were advising? Um, we didn't have proper pandemic preparedness plans uh, in the drawers, which uh, we should have in one way or the other. Stock and supply management has been issued. You know all this because it's been all over the media, virtually all over the world. It's been very similar challenges that we've seen uh, around the world. Um, so, but this, this is basically uh, in contrast to a VUCA event. So our system is set up uh, to run a routine, but it's not set up to deal with, to deal with emergencies of this scale. Um, and that is just something I want to put um, uh, as my last slide um, to look into. Uh, what can we learn also from uh, preparedness and prevention uh, programs also in, 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 in uh, countries in the south, because I think there's a lot we can learn here in, in the west where we are very strongly focused on curative care. We're not investing a lot in preventive health care or in public health care. Um, also something that 
I personally find is, a, is an issue, um, but I think we will discuss this later on, is uh, the communication um, from, uh, from science uh, into the population and into, uh, into the politics uh, has been definitely a, an issue of challenge uh, and also the, the way how decisions were being made and how they were being communicated. Um, I will leave it here and pass over to, um, to the most interesting part, which is the people who talk about their projects uh, and see what we can learn from their projects um, uh, for our German setting. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joost. Um, this is the cornerstone of our further discussions, but you're right, uh, we'll come back to the German context in a moment. Mm -hmm. And now I'll really have a look at the African context. Uh, the Ebola outbreak between 2014 and 2016 in West Africa dramatically exposed the need for more resilient health systems. Obviously, national public health systems were overwhelmed. It led to a rapid spread of Ebola. And it became clear that in order to prevent and to respond to the threat of epidemic prone diseases, a multi-sector engagement and the collaboration among neighboring countries were desperately needed. And uh, we'll have a look at Nigeria in a moment, which is, I think, one example where impressive work was done. But let's first of all um, uh, go to a different region. Let's have a look at the Secretariat of the East African Un Community, EAC, that is uh, mandated to offer advisory and coordinating assistance in preventing and combating infectious diseases for all the partner states with over 180 million citizens. Now, East Africa was obviously not affected by the Ebola epidemic um, of the years just mentioned, but it also frequently experiences outbreaks of this disease and other diseases with great fatalities. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Katende, the Principal Health Officer at the East African Community. He is obviously joining us remotely from the Arusha office. Michael Katende will introduce us to the Mobile Laboratories Network that was established in cooperation with the Bernhard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine uh, since 2017, I believe. And uh, he was, will tell us a little bit about these efforts and um, how the EAC uh, tries to prevent epidemic outbreaks on a regional level. Michael Katende, good to see you online. Thank you very much, Judith. I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this uh, engagement and I would like to thank the organizers for having considered the East African community uh, to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, basically from the region, uh, the chairperson has already said a lot about uh, what's happening. Uh, from the East African Community Secretariat, actually, we are implementing a, a regional uh, project uh, that actually focuses on um, uh, improving the region's capacity to quickly diagnose and respond to outbreaks. And this is the ESC Mobile Lab project. Uh, and this is because uh, we noted way back that our region is prone to um, outbreaks and basically the outbreaks that we have seen over the years, we have seen Ebola, we have seen Mabag, we have seen Dengue, we have seen yellow fever, and many other outbreaks. So we went ahead to, uh, in partnership or with support from the German government, uh, to actually uh, come up with the ESC uh, mobile lab project. This is a network uh, of um, laboratories for communicable diseases. And these laboratories are at biosafety level three and four, actually mainly level, level four, and are able to diagnose the highly infectious viral infections, but also some of the bacterial infections. Uh, in our setup, we have partnered with, um, um, with Bernard Nock Institute of Tropical Medicine, who are actually offering us the technical support in implementing this, uh, pro this project. And this is a, a project that is set up in the East African community. And uh, maybe for your information, the East African community is made up of six countries, that Republic of um, Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and South Sudan. South Sudan is the youngest and new entrant. Um, but we have noted that we, our region is 
prone to these outbreaks. Uh, and part of the reason is uh, that we share a border, four of the six countries share a border with uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is actually has been noted to be a reservoir for some of these uh, highly infectious organisms. But that said, allow me to say that um, we noted that uh, most of the outbreaks were happening in the rural, uh, in the most remote areas of this region in the countries. And uh, it was very difficult to have access to uh, first class uh, laboratory services to diagnose and identify exactly what was happening. It would take uh, uh, between um, 67, almost to about 160 hours before you could uh, get uh, a, a diagnosis. So this uh, facility, which is the mobile lab project, actually allows us to uh, offer uh, services uh, by deploying these laboratories in the region. And these laboratories are able, have been able and have been indicated to, to reduce the turnaround time from those very many hours now. So in event of any we're able to do this in a very short time. Um, this uh, for us in that um, we at the ESC Secretariat are coordinating, but the countries are actually leading the implementation of this mobile lab project. So this is a network of mobile lab uh, uh, laboratories. And what, what we have done basically is to procure nine laboratories, which are mobile, which are fully equipped. And we've also been able to train um, uh, staff uh, who are also trainers. And uh, between 2017 and where we are, we have trained a total of 72 laboratory experts uh, with over 120 support staff. And these are all linked to the, the, the partner states, national uh, central public health laboratory systems. Um, through this arrangement, uh, we've been able to transfer knowledge, which has been done through a combination of approaches. We've done uh, hands-on uh, practical sessions. We have done laboratory trainings, online trainings, but also we have done some field, field missions. So the, the, the issue that I would like to really emphasize here is that um, this, the setup of this network of mobile laboratories uh, in the region actually was timely, I should say came in timely because when uh, we got the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, the region had some capacity to some extent to deal with the pandemic. Uh, in terms of having diagnostic uh, services uh, available at key strategic points. And this has helped uh, in uh, ensuring that the region is able to identify those who are actually sick and offer them quick service or quick, uh, quick treatment and management. Um, these laboratories are rapidly deployable uh, in, the, in, in the most remote areas because they are mobile, they are transported uh, using a, a four-wheel uh, drive a van. And uh, this for us is important because the impact of this has been that through uh, the current epidemic, uh, we have been able to support all the countries uh, in terms of testing. We have conducted over six thousand tests of people in the region. Um, we are able to at least uh, contribute to the timely management of, uh, of the patients. The other important aspect is that to enable these mobile laboratories to uh, the, 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 a, a, a surveillance system that was developed in the region, which is the ESC Regional Electronic Cargo and Reverse Tracking System, which allows has been allowing us to, to actually to monitor the situation of the truck drivers, um, those who are crossing the borders, but more importantly, to allow us to be in position to actually facilitate the movement of people and goods in the region. So to us, this is a, has been a very important uh, undertaking, uh, which has been put in place with support from the German government at UKW.
And of course, if we with our partners, then I'm not Institute of Medicine who are stationed with us in Arusha. Uh, maybe I should just add on a few other aspects that uh, indeed, uh, when you look at this mobile lab, we've been able to um, conduct close identified gaps this between Kenya and Tanzania, and we plan to do another one between South Sudan and Uganda next year. And uh, I would say that uh, it's also uh, we've been able to support some studies like uh, molecular diagnosis for dengue fever in Tanzania. We supported uh, um, uh, a COVID response uh, mission to Uganda in 2019. And I said that we are moving forward to strengthen the region's capacity in terms of uh, responding to outbreaks, uh, quick uh, identification and response to outbreak, outbreaks. Uh, allow me to end here for now, but I'll, of course I will continue sharing. I believe there's a lot to be shared during the, uh, the discussions that will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We didn't hear you that well. There were, were some problems with the microphone. So maybe uh, until we get the next questions uh, to you, you could try to fix that. Um, we have learned from you that uh, a regional response is key to early detection of epidemic outbreaks, also because of the movement of people. And it's always good to be pre prepared because the next epidemic or pandemic outbreak is coming, um, for sure. You also pointed that out already. Um, I would now like to introduce Dr. Tochi Okwa. She is the program coordinator for infection prevention and control at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And she has really played a pioneering role in the institutionalization of a infection prevention and pro um, control program at the national level at Nigeria through her involvement in policy development and resource mobilization, to just name a few. Now, uh, Tochi was supposed to be here in Berlin, and she sent an email Friday night that she would not be able to come. And this was another moment where I realized that we're really still in the middle of a pandemic where travel is not always possible. And um, I'm especially delighted, Tochi, that you made it uh, via internet uh, to join this panel. Thank you, Tochi, Judy. The floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you, um, Judith, and thank you, colleagues. I would like to thank the organizers of this program for um, inviting me to share my thoughts on what we have learned from my experience in Nigeria as we deal with multiple outbreaks and as we are currently dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll come with from the perspective of building a resilient system from lessons learned from numerous outbreaks, but specifically in the area of infection prevention and control in the context of universal health coverage. And I'll start by saying that the 2014 Ebola outbreak in Nigeria really was what can be considered as the, what catalyzed the participation in organized infection prevention and control efforts. During this outbreak, um, I was the national training coordinator and my team was tasked with building the infection prevention and control capacity of every health worker in Nigeria and over a very short period of time. And this was also against the backdrop of very limited infection prevention and control awareness in the country. And over a period of weeks, we had to quickly come up with training programs and training plans. But well, we eventually were able to train all the health workers in all the general hospitals in one of the states in Southwest, in uh, South, South Nigeria, that is River State, and did what we could um, to train as many health workers as we could um, in infection prevention and control across the country. Nigeria will eventually um, successfully bring the outbreak under control and the world felt calmer because remember at that time, the, the, everybody was afraid that Nigeria would be that country that would make Ebola to explode. So um, all the efforts that were put into um, getting that outbreak under control in Nigeria paid off and Nigeria was commended. However, 
for us in infection prevention and control, Jailbreak clearly showed that there was no developed structure for infection prevention and control in the country. There were no infection prevention and control practitioners. There were no training opportunities, no organized way for the delivery of infection prevention and control in the country. And with this gap in mind, we collaborated with um, colleagues from the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. And um, thankfully, um, funds were provided by ExxonMobil through the CDC Foundation. And we worked to develop an infection prevention and control curriculum for the training of infection prevention and control professionals in the country. And then the Nigeria Center for Disease Control keyed into this. Later in 2017, when there was the call for the participation in the development of, um, of national action plans following the global call for the control of antimicrobial resistance, we, we responded and the country began to work on Nigerians antimicrobial resistance national action plan. And I'll say that since then we have gone ahead to establish not only the antimicrobial resistance program in the country, but also the infection prevention and control program. And these have worked very hard and we have worked very hard to strengthen Nigeria's health security through the work we do. And currently these two programs have grown to become a division of its own at the NCDC. And the infection prevention and control program, which we, is according to WHO core components is what we have called the Turn Nigeria Orange. And this is the name we have decided to call our national infection prevention and control program. And that training program we developed during the curriculum we developed during the Ebola outbreak, or as a result of the Ebola outbreak, is now fully integrated into the infection prevention and control um, and the antimicrobial resistance strategic plan, and is also currently in the new infection prevention and control policy. And there's now a growing network of IPC professionals who have been trained using the national IPC curriculum in line with the provisions of our national action plan. But I'll then get into um, how epidemics have shaped um, our health system and how we have worked to also make it a bit more secure. The epidemics of infectious disease, as we know, um, pose a major risk um, to global health security. And Nigeria has a population of over 200 million. We have an annual growth rate of around 2.6%. We have a tropical climate and an increasing connectedness to other countries with millions of flights um, landing and taking off per year. And therefore, all this make Nigeria a very conducive environment for the emergence and re-emergence of infectious diseases. And we really haven't been spared these um, outbreaks. Between the 2014 Ebola outbreak that I've discussed and the current COVID-19 pandemic, Nigeria has responded to large, multiple, and sometimes concurrent outbreaks of Lassa fever, yellow fever, meningitis, smallpox, measles, and cholera. And in fact, we are actually still um, responding to a Lassa fever outbreak when the COVID-19 pandemic started. And often, an outbreak of Lassa fever was heralded in the past by healthcare worker deaths. So usually how we knew that an outbreak of Lassa fever, when we started suspecting an outbreak of Lassa fever, would be when we start getting reports of health worker deaths. And even the Ebola outbreak of 2014 was largely nosocomial with a high um, proportion of health workers um, infected. So all this resulted in a growing understanding in Nigeria that health facilities can amplify and they do amplify emerging infectious diseases, not only within the health facilities, but also in communities. And that strengthening IPC preparedness and readiness will lead to a more robust response contain the outbreaks and prevent the health system from being overwhelmed. And much of the initial work that was done was in the area of Lassa fever because since 2017, we've been having large outbreaks of Lassa fever. So the infection prevention and control pillar became a very strong part of the Lassa fever emergency operation system. Because one thing Nigeria has really, really got working very well for it 
is the operation of the incident management system. We always have for every disease that's a priority disease condition for Nigeria, we have technical working groups, which then transit into emergency operation centers once there's a threshold for outbreaks. So the Lassa Fever EOC, the Lassa Fever technical working groups and the Lassa Fever EOCs helped us perfect our use of infection prevention and control um, during um, outbreaks, how to deploy rapid response teams that also have infection prevention and control teams working with them. And it helped us to begin to fine tune the beginning of our infection prevention and control program. So with this recognition of the value of IPC in health security, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and the Robert Koch Institute collaborated to find sustainable ways of improving IPC in Nigeria. And this led to a pilot project titled um, the Morris, that's the Manual of Universal and Outbreak Infection Control. This pilot project adopted a unique educational approach to improve IPC practice in health facilities in Nigeria. And following the success we recorded in the pilot, a scale-up was envisioned in 2019 to further build the capacity in Nigeria. And that is how the NICAID project, which is a project we are doing in collaboration with um, Robert Koch Institute, funded by the German Ministry of Health, came about. And the main objective of this project is to build the capacity of healthcare workers at secondary and tertiary health facilities in infection control. And I would like to say that central to this program is a participatory approach, which encourages and enables who we call change agents at the health facility to identify infectious risks, develop control measures in close interaction with their colleagues and secure implementation of the IPC measures agreed. And why is this important? Often, you will discover that even when health workers have been trained, even when they've been given the materials to work, even when they have systems in place, there's usually sometimes the issues around attitude, the behavioral issues, and sometimes people refuse to participate, refuse to engage. And this is one of the areas that this project is targeting by making change agents who are able to work in the context of their concrete circumstances, collaborate with their colleagues to come up with local solutions. And in that situation, IPC is discussed as a systemic challenge in the hospitals, which requires a development process based on local conditions and the ownership of local actors, such as healthcare workers, the hospital management, in order for this to be successful in the long term. And um, this approach we've developed to call the participatory approach to learning and systems. And this project has targeted the Lassa Fever endemic states in Nigeria, which are Ebony, Edo, and Ondo, as well as the Federal Capital Territory. And I'd like to say here that when COVID-19 emerged, when just at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we realized that the people we had who were most ready to support the, the response effort in the area of infection prevention and control were the team of trainers that we had built up through this project. And they were the ones that were ready and became the first set of people to set out to various hotspots in the country, that's COVID-19 hotspots in the country, as part of the rapid response team members. And those initial work they did formed the basis of the setting up and establishment of infection prevention and control pillars in the various state emergency operation centers. The work they did also formed the basis of even states themselves not having infection prevention and control programs at the state level. And the training materials that we worked together to develop is still what is currently being used um, in the infection prevention and control trainings in Nigeria today. So before I conclude this, my opening statement, I would like to say that what this shows is why it is important to focus on building resilient systems, robust enough to serve during routine times and during um, just with the mindset of providing quality health care, but robust enough to take up the shocks when they happen and respond during outbreaks. That's one of the lessons we have really learned in Nigeria, that while it's good to focus during, for outbreaks, the, the systems you build during outbreaks are not as strong as the ones you start building um, 
before our breaks, but with the mindset that this will serve you during our breaks. So I'll stop here for now and uh, looking forward to other aspects of the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tachi, for this uh, very detailed account of the situation in Nigeria. Um, maybe I should uh, do some remarks on the procedures. Um, we'll now have two more opening statements, and I think then we'll have one short uh, round of questions amongst us on the panel. And uh, we have secured at least 30 minutes of Q and A's and comments also from you sitting here at the Cosmos or following us uh, via the internet. You're also invited to put your questions, questions into the chat. Uh, so to just let you know um, what is approaching for the next uh, part of our discussion round. Um, I would now uh, take a look at the Congo the DRC and the Congo Basin. And I want to first introduce Johannes Schildknecht who is the program manager for Malteser International for the DRC. And he's part of the team that won this year's humanitarian award with a project that is entitled Community Communication as Key for Preparedness Prevention and Response, a comprehensive approach towards epidemics in the Northeast of DRC. And um, the DRC is also experiencing recurrent epidemic outbreaks. I think this was also mentioned by uh, Michael already. Um, uh, you have measles outbreaks, plague, yellow fever, West Nile fever, meningitis, Ebola, and the such. And the focus of your work is really on engaging with the communities affected and uh, work with them. Before you get the mic, I would like to welcome your Congolese colleague, and the National Medical Advisor of Maltesa International, Dr. Jean-Paul Uvoyo Ulangi, who has traveled all the way to Germany today and who is sitting here in the audience at the Cosmos. And he is the official Congolese award winner of the Maltesa project. And he's here in Berlin because he will also attend the award ceremony that will take place this, this week on Thursday. Congratulations goes to you. Maybe a quick round of applause. I would like to take the chance uh, to invite all of you to the official award ceremony for Maltesa um, that is taking place digitally. So you will have the chance to join on the internet this week, Thursday, 6 p.m. Berlin time. You find the live stream on the website, but it's also distributed widely on social media. And El Hach Asi, who happens to be the co-chair of this World Health Summit and who is the chairman of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, will be the keynote speaker. So Johannes, now the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Judith. Um, so as Judith said, the um, activities of our project are implemented in the northeast of the DRC, which is a, a rather resource poor region uh, and there are rural areas. It is at risk of various epidemic disease. So it's, I would say it's an area that uh, Michael correctly referred to as a reservoir of epidemic disease. The project in general has a rather holistic approach to epidemic prevention, preparedness and response. However, here due to the shortness of time, I will only talk about two aspects of this project. Both of them are uh, built on solutions in the community, with the community and led by the community. So the first one of those uh, aspects is um, early detection of epidemic disease. So if you think about it, like who are the first people who are confronted with a new epidemic disease or with new outbreaks of an epidemic disease? It is the local community and the local health worker, uh, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, therefore, the project works with the local communities, trains the local volunteers and health workers in detecting epidemic disease. And in the case of the local health worker to isolate the case in an, in an appropriate way and uh, provide for dignified treatment in order to ensure that uh, nosocomial infections are, well, uh, are not happening. So it's a, it has a strong IPC component, as um, Tochi talked about already. Um, this actually has already shown quite some success, as in 2018, uh, one of the hospitals that we're working with uh, faced the case of an uh, Ebola patient uh, who was not known as being a potential suspect case, but in the hospital they detected it as a suspect case, could isolate it, and even though the, the patient unfortunately deceased, um, there were no further, further cases in the community. 
Um, the main issue here is the, this kind of rapid reaction to prevent uh, like a spillover of epidemic of these cases in the wider community. It also serves in the case of like an already ongoing huge community to just bridge the gap to um, until like bigger support can can uh, can arrive on the scene. The second issue I would like to talk about is uh, risk communication and community engagement. Um, we um, so that means for us to support people in uh, helping people and su to support people to prevent infections for themselves and among their loved ones and thus to break the chain of infection of epidemic disease. Uh, in these cases of, of epidemics, there often are huge mass uh, campaigns of mass communication dealing with certain kind of uh, well-known rumors somewhere that are found somewhere in, on social media, for instance. However, uh, these kind of campaigns have often shown to be ineffective or at least not to reach certain groups of the society. And we see two issues at stake here that render those campaigns ineffective. These two issues are trust and context, including the level of knowledge of the community. Uh, first, the saying remains true with regards to trust. People don't trust the message if they don't trust the messenger. That means if uh, support is needed in, in communicating with people and there might be like an outside agency, national or international, arriving at the scene, this agency does not automatically have the trust of the population. The trust needs to be earned. Uh, the second point is context and level of knowledge. An epidemic is not an isolated incident. It's taking place in a context, in a complex complex, actually, of uh, context of uh, local, local um, social beliefs, social roles, and other kinds of factors affecting the society. Um, so if you do not know this context, or if you misinterpret the level of knowledge that people actually have, um, you might actually miss the point and your message will not reach the people there where it is needed. So as a very simplified example, you could find somewhere in a city or somewhere in social media, uh, a rumor with regards to Ebola that Ebola does not really exist. However, it's not necessarily true that this rumor is everywhere in the society. Some people might actually just need more knowledge about, um, yeah, about how to protect themselves. Or there might be social, certain social groups who are affected in a different way, vulnerable groups that don't have access to the internet, for instance. Um, so how do we address these two issues? Uh, we use the people first impact method. Um, it's also abbreviated as PFIM. This is a highly participatory method for qualitative data collection and community engagement. The focus here is to listen to people, to listen, uh, understand the context, the challenges of the communities, and also the, the response measure, measures that the communities already use. Because usually, even though there might be misinformation in certain communities, uh, the fear of uh, epidemic disease is a basic characteristic of uh, human beings. So people will already do something to protect themselves. And these activities need to be supported. Now, a PFIM session, or the PFIM method basically consists of two sessions. There are community workers from, from us, employed for us, my colleagues, and also um, people from the community are trained in order to conduct those sessions. And the first session is only about listening. The, our, my colleagues and the trained local uh, members of the community, they just listen to the community, to various groups, uh, among which obviously should be vulnerable groups, such as people with disabilities, uh, children, uh, women, and church groups, etc. Uh, after this first session, where they simply listen, there will be a second session where the people engage in a two-way discussion. In the second session, so our colleagues can ask questions, dig deeper into the different issues. Now, this second session is also used to develop jointly a communication plan with the local community. This is very important because it is the local community that knows what information is needed, is needed and what information needs to be spread in what way. Because again, these kinds of issues can be highly localized. There's no one size fits all approach. An example for this might be that uh, of an activity that might be in such a communication plan is an interactive radio session together with some of our well, expert colleagues, together with the people from the community, where they can spread the message and their understanding of, um, of measures that need to be taken. And in our view, this, or it has also shown in the past, this actually addresses the issues of trust and context in a very good way. First of all, as I said, we will we learn about the context and also the community learns about the context, not only in general, also separately for the different social groups. And the second point is the issue of trust. First of all, we as an organization, we face, well, a better level of trust because we are um, in, well, in the face of the uh, um, community, we are no longer a faceless organization coming from somewhere because they know uh, our colleagues, they can ask questions, 
they can interact with us. And the second issue, obviously, if there are people from the local community participating in the communication campaign, usually, well, hopefully, like respected members of the community or respected members of certain social groups, um, well, when they communicate their view, uh, this, well, this creates a trust because we're no longer outsiders. And that would be it. Thanks. Stay in the Congo region. Uh, Ilka Hebinger has the program lead for Central and West Africa of the Worldwide Fund in Germany. Already as part of her doctoral thesis uh, with wild chimpanzees, she dealt with the prevention of disease transmission between great apes and humans. And uh, what I find especially glamorous about Ilka Herbinger is that she holds a PhD in anthropology and biology which is a rather fascinating combination. And uh, she will tell us more about the One Health approach that is being implemented by the World Wide Fund in the Congo Basin. And I th we've heard a lot about uh, communication strategies and, and the health system and so on. But I think um, what is special about the project that Ilka is um, presenting is that you're taking it one step further with the One Health approach. Thank you very much. I'm very thankful to the Else Gröner Fresenius Foundation that I can be part of this panel and explain you a bit more in detail what WWF with international and national partners and local and indigenous communities has been implementing actually since 10 years uh, in the Congo Basin. We started off in a project called Zanga Zanga Protected Area in the Central African Republic, but we have also used this as a best case study to bring it to Cameroon in Kampoma National Park or in the DRC as well to Malebo. Um, yeah, being a biologist, uh, I have come first into touch with the One Health um, issue, basically when I was studying chimpanzees. And while studying chimpanzees, I came very close to these animals. Um, and basically, I not only witnessed that the population in general declines because of poaching and habitat loss, but also because or foremost because severe zoonotic diseases. And these were diseases like Ebola, anthrax, but also respiratory diseases that humans bring into these populations. Um, when I joined WWF in 2011, already in my PhD studies, I made contact with Fabian Lenders, um, who has been uh, leading a research group on epidemiology at the Robert Koch Institute, which has been mentioned already several times today. And he's now the founding director of the new One Health Helmholtz Institute that will be opened up in Greifswald. And when I joined WWF together with the Robert Koch Institute, we basically set up a One Health approach that really had the aim in projects where WWF works in ecotourism and where humans and animals come very close together, that we have a continuous surveillance system, an early warning system in order to prevent not only disease transmission between animals and humans, but also really to set up a, a continuous surveillance system for animals, humans that are in close contact with these animals, local communities, indigenous communities that live with nature and animals and um, yeah, bring this all together. Um, and basically, this is not only important to stop the spread of diseases, but also because the local indigenous communities, which we have stressed so much today, they are depending on this healthy wildlife. If this healthy wildlife is gone, in these remote places, often projects like tourism or research or park management are the only employers and the only way of providing income for these um, indigenous and local communities. So while saving the animals and the environment, you also provide for their sustainable long-term living. Um, so what did we do to, to set up this One Health program? Basically, we established um, really local small scale field laboratories. We talked about mobile laboratories as well elsewhere, where it really is, and you see, I brought a few pictures. It's really a, a very small local hut, which basically then provides nevertheless for the ability to diagnose on site with PCR techniques diseases. Um, and we trained and capacitated local and national veterinaries to be on site and basically have the local indigenous communities as the ears and eyes to detect abnormal uh, circumstances. So basically what we did, we observed habituated animals. In, in the Congo Basin, we work with gorillas and bonobos. So we observe them daily. So we know when they are healthy, but we also then are capable of knowing when they're sick. And this is the first um, alert when animals get sick and humans are in close contact, indigenous 
local communities live with these animals, then you can also see if there's a further spread of any sicknesses in the local population. Therefore, we observed carcasses. So every animal found in the forest, be it by either local communities, indigenous communities, eco guards that work in the forest, NGOs that we have capacitated to, to observe this, uh, civil society actors. Um, when they found carcasses, they alerted the veterinary, which is fully equipped with full protective security equipment to undertake sampling. And then we have the field lab, which can diagnose it in the field ad hoc and very quickly within a few hours, basically diagnose if there's a sickness and if this is of public health um, importance. We also developed standard operational procedures and communication plans from the local to the national level, which can then, of course, be brought to the international level. So basically, as we said multiple times before, it's really important that you are prepared before a pandemic happens, because if it happens, it's too late. Everybody's afraid, everybody is it's chaos. But if you have pre-established communication plans and you know what to do, who is talking to whom, who is alerting whom, who is the first one to alert the next one on the regional level? Level, and then it goes to the national level, then you can really, as we have said multiple times today, you can react quickly and you can actually prevent that a disease locally gets an epidemic and then gets a pandemic. Um, and this capacity building on site really for national veterinaries and for local civil society actors is paramount. And this has been proven that this is successful as well during the recent epidemic outbreak in Zanga Zanga. We actually succeeded in not only uh, the local population was aware, was not afraid, took the ownership to react by themselves. And what they, for example, decided is they, the indigenous population decided themselves, they're going to quarantine in their hunting camps. So they took the initiative, they knew what was coming, they never heard of COVID before, okay, now this thing was called COVID, but they knew this is a zoonotic disease, it can be dangerous. Throughout the whole communication and awareness that we did for years, they knew they need to react and they decided themselves, let's quarantine in our hunting camps, this is the best we can do. And let's not move and let's, let's look how we can deal with this pandemic. So I think this is another best practice example of, and we have said this multiple times, the first ones to get in contact with these diseases are the local indigenous people. They know how to react. They know that, there is, that it's needed, but we need to bring it from the local to the national and to the global scale to prevent further issues like we had with COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Ilka, for summarizing this so nicely. Now, when looking at the time, um, we'll have now one question round that is just amongst the panel. Then we'll he hear Joost and afterwards the floor is open. So please prepare your questions and comments. Um, now, the one question that goes to all the panelists. Um, from your experience, you have now introdu introduced all these measures and what um, is your assessment? What will be sustainable and which measures are more difficult to sustain? Maybe Ilka, you want to go first. Yeah, I think what is really needed is basically capacity building. As we said, this is like, it's one little project that I, I I sort of presented, but we need this on multiple levels. We need this all over the country. So if we are locally prepared, then I think we can also bring it to the regional and national level. And therefore, I think we really need to increase capacities to diagnose, to, um, uh, yeah, to first of all, to detect and then to diagnose and then to also report these cases so that we can all have a, an effective response. And I forgot to show the pictures now, but maybe we have time Wait, later. Maybe we have time later. <laughs> Um, it's always good to have them handy. Um, let's go back uh, to Tochi and Michael who are joining us remotely and have a quick answer. Maybe Tochi, you would like to answer the question quickly from your experience, what is sustainable and what is difficult to sustain? Okay, and um, thank you very much. I think um, what in my view will be the most sustainable is building structures, building systems that endure. And um, in our particular case, building subnational structures, often a lot of e emphasis is placed at national, but where the action happens is at the local government level, it is in communities and it is in, is in states. So building those structures and carrying along the political um, arm of um, the system 
because the state, the state governors in our own case, case in Nigeria, the politicians at the end of the day are the ones who take decisions on even how healthcare is funded on to the extent to which all our preparedness efforts can happen. So when we're able to build those systems and from the very onset, ensure that we engage our politicians so that they understand what the risks are, we take these discussions outside conferences like this and take it to where the politicians are so that ahead of time, they themselves are appreciating the risk and also appreciating what will be expected of them or what is expected of them. I think that would be one of the very um, ways that all the preparedness efforts can be sustained. Thank you. Yesterday, I heard a panel in this room and uh, one of the panelists said the city mayors are the ones who rule the world because the local level is so important. Michael, a uh, very quick answer from your experience. What is sustainable? What is difficult to sustain? Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, from the context of the ESC with the mobile lab project, um, basically, the, the running the mobile labs is sustainable and this uh, will be possible if we are able to integrate fully these mobile laboratories into the public health laboratory systems in the countries and uh, to some extent I, I am seeing this happening in the region most of the countries are doing this and are running for it and uh, of course the other aspect which is go, go, uh, I, I would think uh, is important but challenging to sustain is uh, diversifying. I think we could, uh, uh, as a way of ensuring that we have sustainability of these mobile laboratories and that they are able to offer the, uh, the countries the, the services they need, we need also to diversify and widen the scope of the uh, disease entities they are covering. And if we diversify the functions of the laboratories, then they can support research, they can support clinical care beyond, the outbreaks. And uh, I think that this will require uh, a coordinated, harmonized approach from the, from in, at the country level, but mainly at the regional level, it's sustainable if the countries are able to work together, share experience, uh, share knowledge and data. Uh, and this is where the challenge is. But I think that uh, with this networking project uh, integrated within the public health systems is sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We also want to hear my teaser. And uh, Johannes just indicated to me that uh, Dr. Jean-Paul would like to answer the question, uh, what was especially sustainable in your project work? Um, please feel free to use the microphone. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Jean-Paul from Malteza. Please from... turn to the audience so that everyone can see you. <laughs> I'm Dr. Jean-Paul Voyo. I come from Congo. I'm, I work with Malteza International. I want to speak uh, in French because my English is low. Alors, pour la durabilité, comme c'est demandé, il est, il est très important, comme Johannes uh, l'a présenté, et Madame Ilka aussi, qu'il faut garder cette approche communautaire. Mais je voudrais aussi épingler que cette approche communautaire devrait commencer avec l'analyse des risques, l'analyse des risques avec la communauté. Avant d'élaborer un plan de contingence, il faudrait que la communauté participe déjà à cette analyse des risques. Et quand la communauté participe, ça va permettre de détecter rapidement les épidémies au niveau local, même s'il n'y a pas encore un laboratoire spécifique mais ils peuvent déjà détecter localement sur base de définitions locales communautaires de la maladie. Et là, ça permet alors à l'équipe locale qui était formée en réponse contre l'épidémie puisse intervenir vite. Deuxième élément dans l'élaboration de, de, de ces plats, il faudrait que les comités locaux soient mis en place, gérés par les autorités locaux. C'est cet comité local qui permettra qu'il y ait des, des simulations réalisé régulièrement au niveau local, simulation à une épidémie, réalisée par les volontaires qui se sont retrouvés au niveau de la communauté. Troisième chose, alors que ça serait qu'au niveau local, qu'on ait un comité qui gère un petit stock stratégique de ripostes. Donc, si déjà l'autorité locale s'est intéressée, 
ils peuvent avoir des stocks stratégiques de ripostes en permanence. Et sur base de ces trois éléments, alors on peut faire un plat de cotégence euh, intégré avec la communauté et toutes les parties prenantes. Ça, ça peut être durable, même en l'absence d'une intervention, la communauté locale et les organisations locales peuvent riposter aux épidémies. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Dr. Jean-Paul. Maybe in three sentences uh, for those of us who don't speak French. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thanks, Dr. Jean-Paul. Um, keep it short, please. I'll keep it short, <laughs> sorry. So, Dr. Jean-Paul reiterated the importance for uh, sustainability of local approaches, which includes um, local uh, risk analysis with the community, local committees that are capable of, of addressing cases of epidemic disease. And for this, they need uh, emergency stocks, local emergency stocks to to, uh, to re respond rapidly um, without the need to, for, of some high-tech solution, uh, which might of course come in the long term, but like a local lab laboratory is probably uh, difficult to sustain in the long term for everyone. But yeah, it's the, uh, the local solution that he uh, wanted to support. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's one of our conclusions already, the local is quite important. Now, coming back to you, Joost, we've heard a lot about challenges and successes. From your European German perspective, what is particularly remarkable about these in initiatives that we've learned about? And from your perspective, what would be instructive and possibly transferable for the German context? Yeah, not really an easy question. Uh, I'll try my best. But um, you're the expert. <laughs> okay, oh, oh, the expert. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I will start with the with the with the original project uh, that Dr. Katenga, uh, Katende was presenting. Um, uh, what what I found um, particularly thrilling is um, having a project that goes beyond borders, that uh, includes a whole region, um, is well embedded into the national disease surveillance programs and action programs. Uh, I think a learning point um, here for the European setting could be that uh, it might make sense uh, to look stronger and also be, be more open about comparing what's happening here to other countries. Like in Germany, it was pretty clear that we've been lagging behind four to six weeks uh, in, in the pandemic uh, as compared to other European countries like Italy and France. So we could actually see where we would be in six weeks from now because we could tell from the other countries. And this happened in the first and the second and in the third wave. So um, uh, from this project, I'll take, I'll take this as a key message. Um, mobile laboratories is fortunately not really an issue in Germany. We have, we have a mass uh, of laboratories available, but uh, still this, this uh, thinking cross borders, I think is something that we can definitely learn from, uh, from this particular project in the, in the East African community. Um, then uh, going to Dr. Tony Okwa and Nigeria, um, the, uh, what I understand as, as a key message from her presentation and also from her work is, is simply the following. The protection of health professionals is the prime priority in any outbreak scenario. If my health professionals, if, if I can't even protect my health professionals, I can't get anywhere. Uh, I think this is uh, in a very brief summary um, what, what uh, to Dr. Tony was presenting. And uh, so uh, training uh, on the one hand on IPC, but also uh, having available um, personal protective equipment on the other hand is something that uh, is of utmost importance and something that needs to be uh, taken care of, uh, kind of like closing the circle uh, to your comments, um, Dr. Jean-Paul about uh, contingency stocks uh, that need to be available. Um, also here in Germany, that has been uh, a major issue. Um, also, what I, what I found interesting was, was the idea of change agents uh, who work locally uh, in, uh, through health facilities. That is something because talking about pandemic and talking about change of behavior, which we all had to do with masks and keeping a distance and you know being locked in, whatever, this is change management of its finest, and this is something that uh, uh, is something that I think also we can we can learn from in terms of communicating uh, towards the population. Uh, um, leading to my to my, my my third observation of the Malteser project, which uh, I have been studying quite intensely uh, in the preparation, because the first the people first impact method is something that I was wondering whether it's uh, something we can introduce in Germany. Um, I've been I've been dealing with uh, communicating towards refugees and migrants. That's my my particular focus in my job, uh, and that has been uh, a major challenge. Talking to people who have their own social media networks, 
through which rumors are communicated of all kinds and we had no way of approaching these people and addressing those rumors. Um, so I was actually wondering whether uh, talking about trust level of knowledge um, also within the German population is something very particular as we all know from the German media, those of us who are from Germany. Um, uh, I think it's been the same virtually all over the world. Um, and uh, that's something that I, I, I think is, uh, is, is worthwhile looking into. Um, uh, also understanding knowledge, knowledge, attitude and practice. Uh, um, uh, so basically doing a decent lessons learned project, a decent lessons learned process of what has gone well and what hasn't gone well, uh, also in terms of uh, communicating to, to um, people. Um, and closing with uh, observations from the World Wildlife Fund from the, from the um, project, which I found extremely thrilling because uh, it is um, the first time that I hear that a One Health concept is actually really being approached, um, not from the health provider side, um, uh, because normally it's the health people who are supposed to do something about it, and uh, uh, um, which, which is tricky because talking about One Health is something that um, needs to, again, talk about change management because we need to break silo thinking. The health silo, the public health silo, even, even you know, curative and public health are, are in silos, and so are also the other branches. Uh, and breaking this is uh, is the underlying concept of One Health, um, and it's 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 really fascinating to see this actually working in uh, um, in real time uh, in a resource poor setting, and that is something we can definitely learn from uh, also here in terms of being prepared. We don't we are not the country in Germany where we have. Um, uh, well, with few exceptions maybe, but where we have um, diseases emerging from here, but it's mostly from resource poor settings and in, in communities uh, that are not well prepared. So I'm, I was actually thrilled to see all those projects uh, doing exactly that. And uh, I think there's a lot of learning um, for, for, um, for the West out of these projects. Um, so I just need to close also with one sentence, which is maybe, no one size fits all. And we need to look at, at the local setting. That's something we haven't done in the beginning. We have been very strongly focusing on, 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 on national um, advice um, and then eventually learning that is actually, you know, it makes sense to look locally and have local measures in place. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. The floor is yours. If you have any questions um, from the audience, please approach the microphone. And I was also advised uh, to tell you that you should not touch the microphone for hygienical reasons. Just a quick comment on the- uh, This uh, is Roland Hansen, my teaser international. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add to Joost's uh, remark and it was really tested in Germany, here in Berlin. So the PFIM approach had been during a training workshop uh, mm -hmm. tested directly with the uh, communities here, social welfare business, and, and it worked out. And I mm -hmm. myself had the opportunity in Kampala in an urban slum PIFIM that was done there. And I heard a psychologist, she said after the PIFIM, she used usually weeks and months to get out information in such a detail from the people with PIFIM, they did it in a one day or two day. So it was really a powerful tool. I, and I can recommend Johannes, maybe you can keep it up. There's a toolkit uh, also for download somewhere. You can find it. It's really, you can get trainings on this, but also help yourself with the toolkit. I would like to add that we have no financial interest in this. <laughs> <laughs> and I would also just like to add that um, PFIM, PFIM has been developed in the, in the context of like humanitarian aid and um, development cooperation, but it's basically based on psychology. So it's, uh, it can be applied everywhere. We've also received a question from the chat that I would uh, like to hand on. How are all these projects financed? Where are the difficulties in regards to financing the projects and how did you solve them? Maybe we turn back uh, to Michael and Tochi first. One of you would like to answer to this question? Okay, um, thank you very much. And this is Tochi. The, I mentioned two projects, the, the curriculum development project. This one was part of the Ebola Fund um, post um, 2014. It was funded through the US CDC. But the beautiful thing is that with that seed funding, the country has owned that curriculum. The country has developed a, an IPC professional 
um, plan for building IPC capacity in the country. So um, that fund has been very useful. And then for the participatory approach in learning in systems, the NICAID IPC project is funded um, by the German government. But then built into it is also um, the sustainability framework to ensure that the country owns it. So it's not just the funding, a lot of the human resource part of it is provided um, through um, um, the Nigerian counterparts. Thank you. Yes, um, if I may come in quickly also, um, the network of mobile labs uh, for common diseases in, in the East African community uh, is funded through uh, support through the KFW by the German government. Uh, but as I said in my presentation, uh, these laboratories have been mainstreamed or have been integrated into the, the health systems in the partner states. And therefore, we, we expect that uh, uh, as we continue uh, putting them to use, uh, the countries are going to be funding uh, the operations of these mobile laboratories. And uh, these mobile laboratories are already being used for disease surveillance uh, as part of the national disease surveillance system. And therefore, uh, we expect that this should be uh, sustainable. However, the other aspect that we're looking at is uh, using these mobile laboratories uh, uh, to undertake research, and other um, study related activities that actually will increase on the funding, especially if they widen on the scope uh, for the disease uh, conditions beyond what is provided for in the project uh, design. And this will also increase, uh, provide funding streams for these mobile laboratories. Thank you very much. Over to you, Judy. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think this is a very crucial question because basically when we started this project in 2011, uh, it was WWF own funds. And as you said rightly, it's not sort of the, the, the thing that you might expect WWF doing in the first place. And um, when the when the Ebola crisis came out in 2014, I really thought, okay, now, now everybody has understood it. Everybody is aware there is there must be people, private sector donors who want to fund this. But no, it was only crisis fund. We we couldn't. We we thought we, we tried to explain. We do prevention. We come in before there is an outbreak. This is the best thing you can do. It is less costly than giving money when there's a crisis. But nobody would fund us. The German government finally, after a year of lobbying, accepted uh, to 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 fund this program. Um, and thankfully for four years. Now it has been mainstreamed. There's again a German government who puts a lot of fund um, into trust funds that are sustainable, that generate actually through interest rates more funds. But I found it very frustrating when in 2014, I was not able to raise funds for such an important subject. And now COVID made it on the minds of everybody. And unfortunately, I must say, only if it concerns the people in the north mm -hmm. that there is some reaction. Yep. As long as it was a southern problem, there was not a lot of um, uh, basically readiness to support this. Mm -hmm. And I would call for this to be maintained, not if after the COVID pandemic is over, please, con you know, consistent funding is needed as a prevention, not only mm -hmm. a cure. Okay, uh, thanks. So for us, uh, fortunately, the funding situation was a little easier, uh, probably, probably also related to the fact that we're working in uh, Eastern DRC, where there are epidemics happen quite frequently and generally infectious disease, also issues like the plague. So uh, our, our donors are well, classic humanitarian and development donors. Uh, it's the uh, Gem German Federal Foreign Office, GFFO, Auswärtiges Amt, the BMZ, uh, ECHO, and then also we work together with uh, Europe Aid. Uh, they actually have a new name now. I think it's Defco. Um, and then we uh, we have our own funds from uh, Malteser International, the German Malteser Hilfsdienst, and partly sometimes uh, from the Order of Malta as well. Yes, hello, my name is Johan Bitzer. I'm a colleague of Judith from the Elsie Kröner of Resinus Foundation. I would like to thank and appreciate all these very interesting talks we've heard so far and would like to come back to the people first impact method. And as we have heard and as we have known, <clears throat> it is also used, was developed also in developing uh, cooperation, can be used maybe to 
get trust and local knowledge of antenatal care and so on. But my question is now coming back to the German setting and yours, you said it could be used in Germany for special groups of migrants or other, mm. not only in COVID, also in other mm. settings. So my question now is, um, or I have two questions first, do you see ways how this can be become true in mm. Germany? And the second one you mentioned in your um, statement in the beginning that the preventive and the public health service in Germany are, yeah, a little low established. And you mentioned something, this has happened over the last four decades. So the second question, was it 40 years ago stronger? Because you mentioned it was over 40 years. Mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Um... Answering the first question is, uh, uh, well, we just learned from Moland Hansen, apparently it has been already piloted, uh, this, this uh, first uh, people impact method, which I, which I was uh, interested to hear. We'll have to discuss this um, afterwards. Um, I think there's various options to get this, to get this implemented and, and, and rather quickly, knowing that there's a manual that uh, we can learn from, which is open access. So uh, that is something we can very quickly put into action. Um, especially in, in collective accommodations, for example, for migrants, refugees, which we cannot send home in a, in a time of a pandemic. So we need to be, you know, especially alert uh, towards this group. Um, uh, and it's very important to understand what their beliefs are. Um, uh, when, when, when I come back to my, my first trainings on, on cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe, I was asking the nurses in the hospital, like, what do you know about cholera? And they said, well, if I touch a cholera patient, I drop dead. And that was my starting point for my trainings, which was completely unexpected, uh, you know, <laughs> so I had to go back and start from from really zero. And uh, um, so, yeah, but maybe you can chip in for, for that. But let me ask, answer the second question. Um, uh, um, let's say after the World War, you know, the, the, the health system was set up in a particular way, which, which uh, um, was running previously as well. And, uh, and public health services, um, most likely have well they have been stronger because they had more responsibilities um uh, as as compared to now where this has been chipped off um by and by and handed over to to um uh, practitioners or you know to hospitals so that they had a bigger scope of of, of work which was which was uh, more understood as being a essential part of um, of the health services and by now this has been has been limited and that makes it less attractive um for for highly qualified staff that we need also in, in, in this branch. But maybe you can add to the, to the first piece. Yeah, I would like to have, um, also because I happen to have worked in uh, well refugee collective housing before I started with Maltesa International. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to have known about the method at that point. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say in all um, situations where you have a community that you can talk to, that come together, it is, is very easily usable. That can be people in collective housing, that can be uh, certain religious groups or other hard to reach groups, football clubs, etc. What might become difficult, which I think might be a dif difference in Germany, is that our German society is getting more and more fragmented. And yeah. I think in many areas, it's difficult to get people together. And it's, there's actually a difference because in the DRC, especially in the rural areas, the society is not as fragmented. You can usually get uh, people, people also very organized. There's a lot of self-organization in the DRC, probably due to a lack of, of governance. Uh, so it's very easy to get all the different groups and representatives together. That would be a challenge in Germany, but it's not a challenge that can be overcome. Mm. And otherwise, it's basically a, a specific form of talking to a group of people without influencing what they are saying. Mm. Uh, anyone who's interested, I can talk about it a little bit more later because I happen to be a trained facilitator. Yeah. So um, we've, we've emphasized the local and it's also uh, of key importance that you include the local leaders uh, who support especially international organizations to try to implement projects on the ground. Maybe Maltese or also the World Wide Fund are not always accepted actors in the field. Um, I, I would like to learn more about this and um, well how do you secure local leadership or the support of the local leaders? What is your experience and your, what are your strategies? Should I start? Maybe, I don't know, Ike, you're Can also you nodding. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think our strategy, strategy is really based on long-term presence in these sites. And therefore you become trusted because you go through civil war times 
you go through uprising problems, you go through pandemics, but you're still there. So basically, Zanga Zanga, for example, WWF is supporting the government and the local indigenous people there since over 30 years. So when you go through all the phases of breakdowns, be it socially, be it economic, be it political, then I think people recognize you're with them. And I think that is, that is the basis for our discussion. It's not that we just come there as a crisis intervention. We are there together. We have local staff, we have national staff, we have indigenous staff. And um, I think that's, that's the, the way to go. You have to build a long-term relationship with this, at least you don't have to, but I think it really helps to build trust if you have a long-term relationship. Of course, I don't want to minimize crisis intervention. This is fully you know, needed. And of course, not everybody can afford to be in, in a site for 30 years, but I think that's, that's how WWF tries to go about. Um, yes, I can only support that statement. So uh, the area that we're working in is also a, an area where we have been for a long time even though you might still not necessarily be known in every different village, because we're talking about an area of, depending on uh, what exact activity we're talking about, of uh, one to two million people. But generally, it's this long-term presence. And then, but you might still show up at this, in, in a situation when there's uh, either an emergency or also in like preparedness measures, there's one point where you are in a certain community for the first time, and not everybody will know about us. So um, when there's no long-term presence in this particular area, then it's yeah, building trust through presence and uh, the long-term presence. It's definitely very important. Uh, with regards to the second point, the community leadership, um, how to um, assure that is first of all, address those people, uh, do not be uh, paternalistic, take all the different um, beliefs and all the different opinions uh, serious. And then the, what, what, but what's generally helping with this is, as I think I've mentioned it before, is this basic common human interest of fighting epidemic disease. And people, for in our case in the Congo, all of them know people that die of infectious disease basically all the time. It's still one of the number one killers. And most of those people have uh, lived in times of uh, epidemics where the loved ones have been dying. So it's just this basic interest that you build all the, all the rest on. Thanks. I, I received a comment via the chat. I think this one goes to uh, Ilka Hebinger. Uh, risk preparedness should focus much more on one health. Um, do you have any additions to that one? <laughs> no, I, can, I can fully support. I think we should really, One Health should be mainstreamed in everything that we do. So in conservation, I think it's not because it's basically the health is in there, has nothing to do with conservation. I think the One Health is an approach where actually you break the silos and you look holistically. And I think that's what we can also learn from local indigenous people. They have a holistic view on life. If you ask them, why do you care for nature? They say, well, I'm nature, I live in nature, I depend on nature. For them, it's not even a question. And in the North, we have such a disruptive relationship mm -hmm. with nature. We don't mm -hmm. coexist anymore. Nature is something you go out on the weekend, you have to travel for an hour and then you are out in nature. But these, these people there, they live in nature and they live with the nature. So they also use the resources in a sustainable way. And of course, today, this is not as easy as that, but uh, in, in some local and, and localized contexts, you can still learn from really the relationship and the respect you have to bring towards nature. And I think this would greatly help the North. We have time for one last question from the audience. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, Please say your name and affili affiliation. Yes, so my name is Marisa Peir and I am uh, um, working for CIRAD, which is a French uh, agency for agricultural development. And I represent the Preserved Initiative here, which is the uh, prevention of zoonotic emerging risk which has been launched by France uh, in January uh, uh, 2021, and which is about uh, a one health approach for prevention and early detection of emerging risks. And I'm very interested, and I think it's glad to uh, see what is happening in the human health uh, field in terms of participatory uh, engagement. So the, what you call PIMF, and that we've been using in uh, animal health for more than 20 years, on, uh, and that we call participatory disease surveillance and participatory epidemiology that has been used and, and greatly uh, um, as a very important tool in the eradication of rhinopest uh, in the early, uh, in the first decade of 20, 2000 as well. Um, and so I would like to, to know, so I think it's great, I mean, what, it's great, but the limit is that often all these uh, initiatives are very confidential and they stayed uh, in silos. So we know that in the environment, 
WCS have set up their own systems as well, based on PIRMF, participatory disease surveillance, epidemiology, whatever it is called and name. Um, and so my question is, how do we all connect uh, these together? How do we ensure that we actually uh, make bridges? Because uh, in the veterinary field, uh, the one health approach is being implemented to work with local communities involving uh, health um, uh, community workers, uh, veterinary community workers, environmental, and it's been the same in the other sectors. So it would be great to find uh, now a great uh, solution to be able to connect all these initiatives to make them much more visible and to make sure that we don't uh, duplicate or waste resources in resources environment, which are very, very scarce already. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can maybe just just um, start um, with regards to um, breaking the silos. It's definitely an interest of us as well. Um, we're as an organization also getting more and more into uh, One Health projects and actually going to start too soon uh, in the end of this year. One actually just started. And I would just like to add then here that the people first impact method is basically a method for communication, communicating with people. And therefore, as uh, Ilka has already talked about, this com community participation, community led um, activities and uh, well here it could I think fairly easily be included because in the in essence it's a, it is a method of communication it is not only for epidemic disease by the way it's just the way we use it yeah maybe I can also just add I, I think basically in, in conservation it's called FPIC free informed prior consent so I think they have all different names however I think what they all have in common is the first thing is you listen you don't come there with your pre identified idea, but you come to get what the other people in front of you want to know, want to do, what they think. And I think then it's of their free choice to say, if you bring an idea, it's of their free choice to say, yes, we, we, we actually comply with this idea or we don't, and we would make it different. So I think basically, no matter how you call it, it doesn't matter. I think the, 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 the way you go about it, to listen, to take into account the other person's view and basically change from their beneficiaries to there are the ones that are leading in, in conservation is the rights holders. Before we always said these projects benefit. Well, they should not benefit, you know, they, they should be led by. And I think that is basically if the, if the philosophy and the, and the vision is combined, it doesn't matter if we call them the one or the other. I think we just need to all understand the approach and bring it, um, yeah, basically work with the donors as well and let them accept this approach because this is another way often donors expect from you to tell you to tell them what you want to do and we're like it is difficult I, I want to first know what the people I want to work with want to do. So I think there's also um, a need for donor agencies and governments to understand that this approach will take more time. It will take it's a more complex process and we but if we ultimately go this way we will do something that will have much greater ownership and participation from and therefore be more sustainable touchy and michael have both raised their hands let's hear a very short final answer <laughs> and then we're really at the end of this panel yeah, definitely. Just to agree completely with um, the need to harmonize and take the One Health approach. For us in Nigeria, um, we actually, our uh, antimicrobial resistance effort is actually a One Health um, effort. So while we are piloting um, these in the infection prevention and control program, it eventually, like I've mentioned, feed into the entire, the overall strategy. So just to lend my voice to not duplicating efforts and making sure that we have this One Health mindset. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just to mention two things. One, uh, that um, yes, I think the One Health approach is taking root and I'm happy to hear that this is on the agenda and we're discussing it here. In the ESC region, we have a One Health strategy, which should be approved maybe this month by the ministers. But also we have a, a, a One Health coordinating uh, uh, structure at the ESC Secretariat. This has been missing, but we are establishing this. And I believe that to strengthen uh, coordination of the One Health approach. I just wanted to also add that uh, from the mobile lab component, probably I didn't mention that the, the issues that we have faced really in the region, risk communication and community engagement has been a challenge. And we need to strengthen this component as we push for the One Health approach, because then we bring on board many stakeholders 
and we need to ensure that this is well done very well. One unique aspect about the mobile lab project uh, for the East African community is that um, we have built local capacity. We have trainers, a set of trainers within the countries and we expect that there will be continuity in terms of building capacity and therefore sustaining and this, uh, this program uh, in the countries. And this is what makes it unique that uh, it's country led uh, and there's local capacity, which is likely to sustain this. And we think that this is a very uh, good lesson uh, that we should take forward as we design and implement other projects, especially with government uh, support. Thank you. Just, uh, you get the last word. What is your most important take home message to Lower Franconia of today's discussion? Um, there's a saying that um, uh, is, has been repeated a hundred times. There is no glory in prevention. And uh, I personally think it's time that this mantra needs to change in one way or the other. Emergency, basically COVID-19 has shown very clearly that uh, emergency preparedness, epidemic preparedness, uh, risk reduction, um, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, strengthening of resilience of, of affected populations is something that has been um, never found any donors. In, in, in my 20 years of, of, of experience, it has been really hard to find any, uh, any funding for this um, because there is no glory in prevention. But this mantra needs to change. We need to say, yes, there is glory in prevention. Um, unfortunately, we can't see the results. That's something that donors want to see. But uh, uh, I personally think we need to change this mantra and uh, turn it around into, um, into a new mantra. Please say thank you to this fantastic <laughs> panel.